Welcome. Hello, and welcome to the second all-conference plenary of AFA 2020. My name is Megan Geigner, and I will be the moderator for this plenary, plenary, which is entitled Envisioning Resilience in Performance. I can tell you as a member of the all-conference planning committee that this plenary came out of a desire to know how the members of the AFA community were continuing to make performance and practice while theater spaces were inaccessible. Each of the panelists will share with us their innovations for performance and practice in the COVID-19 era. They're each gonna speak for a little while and then once they're all done, we'll open up the floor for Q&A. I will now introduce our first panelist, Kaya Dunn, who is an assistant professor at the University of North Carolina, Charlotte in the Department of Theater and affiliate faculty for theatrical intimacy education. And she is an actor, director, and activist. She has been invited to consult or present on issues of equity and diversity for Blumenthal Performing Arts, Actors' Equity Association, Spelman College, Emory University, the Women's Theater Festival, Misha, North Carolina Theater Association, keynote panelist, George Mason University, keynote July 2020, Children's Theater Charlotte, as well as for schools and private corporations. She has published in the US and has two co-authored publications coming out in the UK. One for a new art and research companion to Shakespeare in contemporary performance on decolonizing Shakespeare in performance, and another for the theater dance and performance training special against the canon, training theater students of color in the USA. Dunn has presented her work on equity, diversity and inclusion, as well as anti-racism and decolonization at University of London Goldsmiths, SETC and SETC Theater Symposium, KCACTF and the Association of Theater and Higher Education, among other places. She is on the board as secretary of the Black Theater Association. Her primary research focus is on using theater to facilitate complex cultural conversation and reimagining theater training for actors of color. You can follow her on Twitter where she frequently posts about EDI issues under the handle at Kaya Dunn. Kaya's presentation is titled Radical Imagination, Marginalization into Resilience. Thank you, Megan, and hello to everyone. Um, before we start, I want to mention that, like so many of you, I have three small coworkers, uh, children at home. And so if they come, uh, they're pretty professional at Zoom right now, um, and you may see them at some point. Um, the first week of March, I was gearing up for what my students would call an Instagram worthy weekend. In one weekend, uh, and the following week, I was preparing to co-launch a session on race and intimacy, gathering um, people of color from all around the country and some international artists. I had a monologue premiering at the Billie Holiday's 50 and 50 that was going to be read by Pauletta Washington. And I was giving a national presentation for Actors' Equity. I was incredibly excited. And then in the course of three days, the first week of March, everything went away. And this was right before there was a national shutdown when people were still sort of saying things would be okay. Princeton was one of the first schools to shut down. Um, and so while I was mourning the loss of this pivotal thing that I'd been working towards in my career, uh, my kids still had rehearsal and my school was still doing rehearsal and I was feeling incredibly isolated and alone. Um, Fast forward a couple weeks, the country shut down, um, and I was contacted right in the middle of March by Johanna Edwards at Women's Theater uh, Festival in North Carolina, who asked if I would be willing to do Lauren Gunderson's Natural Shocks. Um, this was sort of a lifeline for me, and I became incredibly excited. Uh, Natural Shocks is a one woman show that takes place in a basement. Um, go. Uh, it's a one woman show that takes place in a basement and it's about a woman who's trying to survive a natural disaster. Um, and during the course of the play, you hear what you think is a natural disaster coming closer and closer. And it talks about risk and humans intolerance for risk and what happens in the middle of disasters. 
uh, and the play happened March 26. So it felt super prophetic, even though it had been written years before. Um, and it felt like it was made for Zoom because of the idea of the enclosed space um, and the, the, the intimacy of doing a monologue to the computer and being able to have a reading where it was right there in the camera. Um, spoiler alert in the play, the tornado is actually her husband. And so the play deals with the idea of domestic abuse. Now there were so many aspects to this project happening at the beginning of COVID and things that we discovered. The first was the uniqueness of it and realizing that there was going to be a technique as I'm sure so many of you have realized um, that there's a technique to Zoom acting. And so I realized that there was an upstage or a downstage. What would happen if I moved close to the camera or further away? Um, we learned about ways to set up uh, and so um, as I played with levels and where to put the camera in rehearsals, we figured out the best um, that having the camera at a slightly higher angle looking down on me gave the feel of being trapped. A lot of the audience said that they felt claustrophobic, like they were in the basement with me. Um, and then also playing with setup. And so I had, at the time, I had a couple of soft lights. You can see I didn't even clear my nightstand. Um, we set it up on a card table. And that little corner was my acting space. But within that corner, I had some freedom to move around. Um, but the thing that I truly discovered and where I wanted to lead with uh, my contribution today was in the process of the final rehearsals, I realized that doing theater virtually opens up an entire world that has been off limits in terms of accessibility, in terms of being able to show up and in terms of talking about things that are often restricted to certain populations because of resources. So one thing that was pretty cool was I got to be in the room with Lauren Gunderson. Um, but the other part of things that was really amazing is in rehearsals, we realized that we were all, except for our stage manager, we were all mothers. And so I did a show while present with a director in another city who has a special needs child. My child was running in and out. Lauren Gunderson had Thomas the Tank Engine on in French because she's special and her kids speak French. Um, and, uh, and then we had a partnership um, with a domestic violence shelter and the woman who ran that had her kids and it became this communal thing um, where we all realized that the thing that had often kept us out of rehearsal rooms or from participating in projects became our superpower in that moment. The fact that we were used to handling things and multitasking and were able to continue this project while also taking care of our families and homeschooling in the middle of a pandemic, there was a moment where we all realized, yeah, we've got this. Um, and it was that sense of we've got this that really helped propel the project forward. We were able to be present and be fully ourselves. So we were able to discuss both the chaos of COVID-19 and also raise hundreds of dollars for a women's domestic violence shelter about three weeks before the newspaper started talking about the pandemic of domestic violence and the issues with shelter in place. It allowed for a new access and a new creativity. And then came processing. A few months ago, before COVID started, I had gotten a small grant through a Charlotte Arts um, Collaborative, the Arts and Science Council, um, to do a show about a Black female economist and um, her husband who was Latinx and undocumented. And the idea from this story came out of a space that didn't exist. Um, the conference planner and vice president of ATHA, Carlos Cruz and I had done a show a couple years ago and we had looked for a love story between an African-American and a Latinx uh, man, an African-American woman. And we were looking for a two-hander and we could not find anything. Um, and Caridad Sivich very graciously recommended her play Archipelago. But the idea that I had so much trouble finding this story and especially a story that dealt with the complexities of the relationship in these two communities um, and the complexity of this love story, which exists in my own family and the idea of uh, migration and documentation, 
not just through a Latinx lens, but also through uh, a Black diasporic lens. And so I ventured into production for the first time. Um, and then in the middle of that, everything was shut down. And so we had booked a space and we had had actors, we had set a date to have everybody come in and then COVID happened. And so we did a quick pivot um, instead of the, the actor, some of the actors couldn't do it anymore because we couldn't meet in space. And so we started to dream. Um, I, along with my director and co-producer, Jamika Holloway Burrell, and our, um, our playwright who we had commissioned, Celeste Jennings, started to think about who would be our dream cast. Um, and then we took the funds that would have gone to space and other things that would have gone to an in-person reading and put those resources to an online reading. Um, and so we were able to develop our dream cast and they were from California, Miami. I got to work with one of my colleagues, Chris Berry, who was in New York. Uh, Jamika was in Durham, North Carolina and Celeste uh, was in Arkansas. And we got to meet up and work together. And again, we discovered some of the difficulties. Uh, I had gone from doing a monologue and I was like, I don't know what everybody's complaining about. This Zoom setting is super easy. And then I realized the difficulties that happen when you are in fact doing it online and trying to do a love scene um, while trying to focus on the person and simultaneously focus on the camera. Um, there were also difficulties in learning to produce on the platform. We used Twitch. Um, and so we were using a video game streaming service through Zoom. Uh, at one point, our platform crashed and we had a 28 minute delay uh, at the start of the production. So it definitely wasn't seamless and completely smooth, but we were still early on in the process and we discovered uh, that we could do a lot. As I said, the first one was I could allocate my resources where my values were. So I rescinded my director's fee and we took all the money and were able to pay above equity wages to all the actors, many of whom had lost their jobs. Um, and it was a chance to put into practice the things that I believe about theater. But the other thing was I was able to get really great mentorship. I reached out to Jamil Jude and a couple of other producers and really got my hands dirty learning about different aspects of production. Um, we were able to talk about a group that is often unseen, which is Black female economists. Um, I'm a bit of an economics nerd, and so I had been following the story and um, collaborating with Celeste on the script. And one of the most exciting things about this project is who we were able to have in our talk back. Um, so Daphne Secre, who's also an AFA member, came in to talk. Jamil Jude moderated the discussion. Um, we had the Sadie Collective, which is a collection of African-American female economists who just had Janet Yellen at their last um, summit. And they joined in partnership and they got the word out. And so our audience became this huge collection of economists, uh, especially black and other marginalized economists from around the country, which never would have happened if we had done it live and in person. Um, and so one of the things that you can see is that they started tweeting about it and Black Econ Twitter, which is a thing, blew up with people talking about the show. Um, and one of the forms of feedback we got was that people were really grateful to see these nuanced portrayals. And so I, um, sorry, I just wanna think about um, as I wrap up, what happens when we allow for radical imagination instead of trying to hold on to the normal? Both of these projects allowed for um, a space to be seen instead of unseen. They allowed for a period of um, revisioning, a reallotment of resources to be able to pay attention um, to the generosity of space. Um, in her book, Black Girl Magic, Dr. Julia Jordan discusses the complex lived realities of Black femmes, girls, and women in the face of and as a result of gendered, raced, classed, and sexuality oppressions. And June Jordan says the creative is always the political. And what um, Dr. Jordan talks about is that in search of our mother's gardens, Alice Walker suggests that despite race, gender, class, oppressive structures, Black women 
handed the creative spark, the seed of the flower they themselves never hoped to see, or a sealed letter they could not plainly read, were able to produce and to create. And so as we go forward, I wanna think about what would happen if we, um, if we listened to black women and other women who learn resilience because they're on the margins. What if we'd listened to Roberta Uno in 1984, Toni Morrison in 1975, Haley Quinn Brown in 1885, or Dr. Tier in 1972? And what if we listen to those on the margins now to look at their creativity, resilience, and resourcefulness? Thank you. Thank you, Kaya. Our next speaker is Toby Posser Sue, who is a theater maker, writer, and scholar who specializes in devised cross disciplinary work. He lectures in drama at Bath Spa University, UK and is undertaking an AHRC-funded PhD at Queen Mary University of London. His research centers on race, puppetry, and politically engaged performance. As co-artistic director of Waddle and Dobb, Toby has co-created and performed in The Depraved Appetite of Tarare, Tarare, The Freak, and Triptych. He has directed puppetry for shows including Tom Morris's A Christmas Carol at Bristol Old Vic, and Heidi a goat's tail at the egg. Other companies he has worked with include Fine Chisel and Lost Spectacles. Toby's presentation is titled, My Face, the British East Asian Body as Object and Insurgent Subject. Thank you so much, Megan. So as the experiences of this wonderful panel bear out, in the immediate panicky aftermath of entering lockdown, for many theatre artists, resilience and indeed survival inevitably seemed to mean going digital. A lot of companies, including my own, released video captures of live shows. Uh, and for me, it was really comforting to see work and to have our own work be seen. But at the same time, these film shows often felt more like an archival record of an artwork rather than the artwork itself. But if that's not digital theatre, then what is? If we say that digital theatre is theatre created to be streamed on video, then what makes that theater rather than film with bad production values? What can we specifically bring to the table as theater artists? The piece I'm sharing an extract from today is a piece that was commissioned by the British performance collective, Scotty and Friends. Now, this was back in early April, right at the start of lockdown. And one thing I was immediately struck by in moving my practice online was the immediacy that it allowed for. I was able to get something out into the public eye within days of starting to write it. And what that means is that this is very much a snapshot of a particular moment in time, when the dialogue in the UK was still mostly around personal hygiene rather than public health. Obviously, the discourse and the semiotics around COVID and masks in particular has shifted significantly since that time, particularly in the US. However, at that time, it felt like the narratives around COVID, particularly around face touching and hand washing, were framing parts of my own body as these anarchic, dangerous presences that I couldn't control. Alongside this, the East Asian body in particular was being conflated and linked with the invasion of a dangerous virus, and masks were increasingly racialized as part of a wider stigma around East Asian bodies. I'm very interested in the ways in which the racialized body is objectified, and as a puppeteer, I'm interested in how puppets, as literal objects, might enter a dialogue with this as well as how the inherent anarchy of puppets might offer opportunities for critique and resistance. However, it wasn't until working digitally um, with the abilities that this gave me to play with scale and the density of images that I was able to start playing with my own objectified body as a puppet. So I'd like to leave you with a couple of questions as you watch uh, a five minute extract from the uh, approximately nine minute piece. Uh, firstly, is it uh, theater or just bad film? If it is theatre, then why? What is theatre specifically bringing to the table? Uh, secondly, I, I wonder if working in a new form where I didn't understand the rules, filming myself on a distinctly outdated phone in the office that you see behind me, might have made me more willing to work irreverently and play with jarring shifts in tone. I'm curious if this is something inherent to digital theatre. And uh, finally, just a note that this piece contains references to racism. Thank you. It's 
disorienting, this disorientalizing of the mask that's going on. I'm trying to calculate when it's time to wear one, when we're more afraid of droplets than of faces like mine in masks like this. This face, or the top half of this face. Does this bit look like the face of the pandemic, bringer of the virus, eater of offal, congregator in large, noisy families who understood masks, who knew to wear masks? wore masks and became the face of the pandemic, which was not a face but a mask and a face like mine on the bottom half of a face like mine. And now we're all meant to wear masks. And now it's time to deracialize all the masks, to photograph masks on white faces, to deracialize masks with the top halves of white faces, to deracialize masks with the same focus, with the same determination, with the same zeal with which the virus is not deracialized. This Chinese virus is not deracialized. The top half of my face is not deracialized. takes time to lather me perfunctorily it feels as if he hasn't cared for weeks just so Guys, this is weird. This is really weird. Uh, uh, can we just get back to the stuff about the mask? Let me take you back to the Manchurian plague and a visionary doctor called Wu Lian Tei. He was a pivotal figure in public health development, a pioneer of cloth masks. That's why he's relevant. The first Malayan to be nominated for a Nobel Prize. And an opiate opponent, even though that was career suicide. He arrived in Manchuria the early 1900s, knew right away this was no time for blunders. Controlled the plague like a public health wonder, created a mask that you could put your face under. Yes, it is I, star of the show. What? On your face On your face What is You wanna see me? My fabric creamy On your face On your face You do realize how the sound Let me see if you really Wanna make me scream I'll wash my hands You better make sure that those Hands are clean With soap and water 
Order. Practice. Good hand hygiene. I'm so protected. When you put my creamy, creamy, creamy folds. Creamy folds. Upon your face. I'm putting it on right now. Thank you, Toby. Our next speaker is Divya Rajan, who identifies as a creative practitioner. She is an inter and multidisciplinary experimental performance artiste whose work is inspired and informed by storytelling, rituals, healing, and spirituality. Her evolving introspection into her identity as a cultural conduit significantly informs roots her foray into site-specific immersive experience design for the collective individual. She just graduated with an MFA in theater arts from Towson University in the midst of the dramatic global pandemic. Her thesis is a deep delving inquiry to her artistic practice, which she believes significantly informs her evolution as an artist. Didya started her journey on stage with theater Nisha in Chennai, India as a lighting designer in 2008. Before moving to the US for her graduate program, she lived in the Philippines for 10 years where she created several one woman performance storytelling shows and also served as the festival director and co-producer of Short and Sweet Theater Festival Manila for four seasons. Divya's presentation is titled, Who is a Collective Individual? Thank you so much, Megan. It's an honor to be part of this plenary and to share about something that is so close to my heart. Roots. My final MFA performance piece was scheduled to take place on May 2nd on a farm in Westminster, a few miles from Baltimore. A site managed by a group of healers practicing homotherapy, this land is also home to grandfather and grandmother oak trees who are more than 300 years old. I had spent several hours at the sacred site, feeling the ground beneath my feet, ruminating at the roots and talking to the trees about my ancestral roots and identity, soaking in the sounds and embracing the air and smell with every cell in my body literally and metaphorically rooted in rituals and storytelling, this experience would have had the audience engage deeply with their roots. Spring break happened, uncertainties mounted, and the rest is history. All performances of the MFA cohort remained canceled. Weirdly though, amidst all chaos and cacophony, I felt unusually calm and centered. It felt like the true test of my artistic process. Roots was all about acknowledging cultural uprootedness in order to connect with our roots. And here, I was abruptly uprooted from the East Coast and rooted towards the West Coast. Thanks to my advisors, asking questions skillfully had become integral to my research and I found myself doing exactly that. Yes, there is chaos. So what are my choices now? Yes, the pandemic is obliterative, but what is the opportunity it presents? Yes, insane number of people are on ventilators and how is that impacting my artistic vision? Yes, there is isolation, but what is it to find inspiration here? Yes, there is death. Death was, death is, and death will be. But in what way is the current dialectic different? And that led to the making of SALT for the Soul, a week-long multi-site specific immersive executed remotely. I made a list of 25 people who had been part of my artistic process, like my cohort, my professors and advisors. People who had been intrigued by the idea and were keen on attending my performance and people crossing paths with whom I was immensely grateful for. I sent them a very personalized invitation to partake in offering salt for the soul. 
19 of them responded that they would love to be part of this journey and thus a collective of individuals from East Coast, West Coast and places in between formed. A prompt for the day found its way to their inboxes to initiate their day for seven consecutive days in the form of poetry, video messages, posters and questions of course. The same questions about roots that over the last three slides I'm sure you are all engaging with. I also ship tiny packages of handcrafted sensory experiences to each of them, including a handmade acorn talisman to pass on the blessings of grandmother and grandfather Oak, whose presence I strongly felt throughout designing this experience. Each one connected with two other stranger and yet no stranger over phone to tell story of their connection to their roots and to listen to another's. Salt the most important connection in this journey, such a universal ingredient with so many ancestral ritualistic significances, versatile and yet the most underestimated. The entire journey was about offering salt for the soul, literally and metaphorically. It was fascinating to see how a little corner with a bowl of salt had suddenly transformed into a specific sacred site a portal to nostalgic realms of their cultural roots. The one ritual that connects me deeply to my roots is this ritual of lighting an oil lamp. This is something I grew up with and this was done every day at dusk at home. I continue to do this till date. I light an oil lamp every day at dusk. Today, in the midst of offering salt for the soul and while connecting deeply with my roots, I'm reminded of yet another ritual that my grandmother used to fondly do on several occasions after she lit the lamp at dusk. She would ask my brother and me to sit on the floor. She would then take a fistful of salt and she would take her hand three times clockwise and three times anti-clockwise around the two of us. And then in quick, brisk moments, she would take her hand from her head all the way to the floor in order to ward off evil eye. And then she would turn around and show this under the running water so that all the salt would dissolve and make its way to the sea. And with that, all the evil eye washing away as well. Somewhere in between, they had all started receiving their sensory gifts. Fascinatingly, collective conscience revealed itself when without being asked to do so, the little packages unanimously ended up beside the bowl of salt. These packages were to be opened only after the final ritual of offering salt for the soul. I have known this tree for a month now. She gives me company as I have my morning coffee and watches over me when I cook in the kitchen. In connecting with her and her roots, I connect with mine. I offer salt for the soul. I now reveal to you what was inside that envelope and I urge you to contemplate too. Who is a collective individual.
Thank you. Thank you, Divya. Our next speaker is Jordan Rosine, a post MFA teaching fellow in the School of Performing Arts at Virginia Tech. He is also the founder and artistic director emeritus of the New York City based physical theater company, the Ume Group, and a frequent collaborator with the Butoh Physical Theater Company, Rengioso. He is a proud member of the Association of Theater Movement Educators, Stage Choreographers and Directors Society, Playback North America, and the international online troupe Playback for Playbackers. He received his MFA in ensemble based physical theater from Del Arte International. Jordan's presentation is titled Envisioning Resilience Through the UME Group's Inaugural Online Playback Theater Event. Thank you very much, Megan. <laughs> and thanks uh, to all the other panelists and for including me here. I'll wait for my slides to pop up. I believe Amy's providing those. Great. So first, as some context goes, um, the Ume Group is a physical theater company based in New York City. And the group was founded by myself and friends from college in 2011. Uh, since then, it's morphed and changed, experienced new leadership, and most recently been on a bit of a hiatus. I left the company in 2016 to attend the MFA program at Del Arte International, which is where I first learned about playback theater from our community-based arts teacher, Saida Trujillo. We did one performance in collaboration with a local organization advocating for families of children with autism, and it was amazing. I was hooked. I've since uh, joined Playback North America and the International Playback Theater Network and begun teaching playback as a part of my applied theater classes at Virginia Tech. This spring when COVID-19 struck and so much of our lives began to shift online, I saw an opportunity to reunite past members of the UME group for a six week experiment in online playback theater. I wanna be clear that throughout this process, I invented basically nothing. I was using playback theater, which is an improvised and community-centered storytelling theater form invented in 1975 by Jonathan Fox and Joe Salas, and which now exists across the globe. Furthermore, in designing our event via Zoom, I was drawing extensively on techniques tested and documented by Anne and Christopher Ellinger and the amazing folks at Playback North America, which is an organization for people who want to explore developing playback skills and which produced that publication of online playback theater. For those who aren't aware, in traditional playback theater, there are five main roles. There's the tellers, the conductor, the actors, the musician and the audience who are each a potential teller. Throughout the course of a playback event, the conductor will solicit stories from the audience, which are then immediately reflected back to them by the actors and musicians, according to a set of ritualized forms. Now, to speak about how resilience was envisioned throughout this experience is both simple and complicated. It's simple because uh, about midway through our six week rehearsal process, the theme we chose for our show actually happened to be stories of resilience. And Caitlin Samuel Rosine, our conductor, who as one audience member said, was so grounded and empathetic as she held space for the audience and guided the event, managed to elicit an inspiring variety of stories, which spoke to the diverse ways that resilience can be expressed. People told stories of being in car accidents, getting locked out of their apartments and cars, helping others in need, and overcoming any number of challenges. On the other hand, the question of resilience is complicated because on May 25th, just six days prior to our show, George Floyd was murdered. By the time our March 31st performance came, news of national uprisings and support for Black Lives Matter had filled most of our news feeds, and resilience seemed to take on a new meaning. It's a necessity for those in our country who experience systemic and intersecting oppressions. As a primarily white company, I'm more curious than ever what responsibility we hold to the country at large. And the events of the last months have fueled exciting new conversations about what it might mean for even our scrappy company to come out of its hibernation and complicitness with white supremacy. But that's a topic for another talk. Though racial justice wasn't a, um, 
explicit theme in our show. It certainly could have been and might be in the future. There are other playback groups doing amazing work promoting racial justice through their art. For our small audience of friends and family who attended and participated in our show, the playback event was an opportunity to give expression to the nameless overflow of intense emotions which that week's news aroused. The experience of having a safe enough space to share stories was furthermore novel and important enough for audience members to write numerous unsolicited thank you notes and donate to our company. And because of the low overhead involved in performing online, we were able to remunerate the actors in a way that um, rivals their past compensation for work with the group. An achievement further amplified by the fact that many of them were impacted by the economic fallout from COVID-19. Part of my personal experience of resilience through this project is, as the title of this uh, recent HowlRound article by Jan Cohen Cruz has it, expanding where, why, how, and with whom artists work. Playback theater specifically demands that artists work in collaboration with the audience of storytellers. And while it's possible and common to think about offering your playback enactment like a gift, after reading more about the successes and failures of other community-based projects, I'm inclined to think of this relationship primarily as a collaborative one and collaborating with audiences in real time, rather than trying to guess what they'll like beforehand, seems to me like a key way of expanding with whom we make work and possibly boosting the resilience of theater as a form. Polyvagal theory, which explores the way the vagus nerve connects social and biological phenomena, has much to say about how being in community helps us to process trauma and boost our biological resilience. So having any sort of theatrical project to work on in ensemble also may have grounded and supported Caitlin, the company, I, and I in a way that helped us as a collective to weather the unknowns of COVID-19. As an industry, I think we can learn an immense amount about play, uh, from online playback theater. In many ways, it's changed my very definition of what it means to be live and to do live theater. The consensual audience interactivity and the connections that blossom from which feel much more live to me than many of the non-interactive things I've seen on stage, let alone a broadcast of a previously recorded Broadway play as are so common right now. As Caitlin is fond of saying it, the core of playback theater remains intact in an online setting, and perhaps much more so than other theater forms adapted for online. By core, she's referring to people telling stories, people listening, and actors reflecting those stories without a lot of production value. She asserts that taking this time in physical isolation to practice skills like listening and conversation will only make our theatrical processes stronger once we can return again to in-person. From my perspective, seeing everyone's faces on a single Zoom page, assuming you limit participation to 25, is also reminiscent of sitting in a circle together and simultaneously seeing and being seen by everyone present. Through its audio processing limitations, Zoom further forces people to slow down and to talk one at a time. And the urgent need for each actor to rediscover for themselves the raw elements of theatricality in their very own living room to employ at the drop of a hat in response to a story that they've just heard for the very first time is a tremendously fertile landscape for personal artistic growth. In closing, I believe that online playback theater provides an opportunity for us to return to the core of what theater is so that we can more equitably envision theater's future, innovating and diverging, fortified by those experiences of community which boost our social and biological resilience. Thank you. Thank you, Jordan. Our next speaker is Kristen Wright, a postdoctoral associate in the Humanities Scholars Program at Cornell University's Society for the Humanities. She previously earned a PhD and MA in Africana Studies from Cornell University, an MA in African American Studies from Columbia University, and a BA in Theater Studies and Political Science from Yale University. Her work exists at the intersections of African American drama from the 19th century to the present, Black performance studies, and critical theory. She has published articles and reviews in theater topics, Black perspectives, 
the Gale Researcher's American Literature Volume, and Texas Theater Journal. Dr. Wright has pieces forthcoming in the Rutledge Anthology of Women's Theater Theory and Dramatic Criticism, and Gotham, a blog for scholars of New York City history. Dr. Wright has been a member at large for the Performance Studies Focus Group of the Association for Theater and Higher Education since 2017, and also served on the American Society for Theater Research Graduate Student Caucus as the representative to the Committee on New Paradigms in Graduate Education. She won the 2018 Information Literacy Prize from Cornell's Knight Institute for her teaching, and Dr. Wright's article, The Killing of My Mother I Claim Myself, Adrian Kennedy's Electra and Orestes, Aeschylus's Oresteia, and the Question of Justice, won the 2016 Marvin Carlson Award for Best Student Essay in Theater and Performance from Cornell's Department of Performing and Media Arts. Dr. Wright is also a playwright and dramaturg, and her plays Apple Corps, Miss Anne, The Shirt, Civility, and Jamal from Empire were produced as part of Cornell's 10-minute play festival. Her new play, Jodeci for White Girls, will be featured in the 10-minute play festival this fall. Kristen's presentation is titled Beyond Miss Anne, Toward an Abolitionist Vision. Thank you, Megan, for that wonderful introduction, and also Amy and Carlos Alexis for your work behind the scenes. Today, I will show an excerpt from a 10-minute play that I wrote titled Miss Anne. Miss Anne was produced as a part of Cornell University's 10-minute play festival in 2017. This plenary examines the resilience of performance in the COVID-19 era, and Miss Anne's resilience is reflected in how it captures the recurring conversations on policing and anti-Black violence. The recording that you will see is a dress rehearsal filmed on my smartphone. This echoes the practice of cop watching, a form of surveillance that allows citizens to turn a lens on the police and empower their communities. This dress rehearsal also serves as a lens into the rehearsal process. The actors were still learning their lines and you, the audience, will see a difference between the subtitles and the dialogue. As this work develops, I intend to shift the focus of the work beyond the titular Miss Anne and its focus on individual police officers. I will show how an entire community is shaped by policing and how communities can be transformed through abolition. The working title of my full length play is A Living Newspaper, inspired by the work of the Federal Theater Project. I want to explore how the conversation around policing has deepened in a post Black Lives Matter world. What are the dynamics that have shaped the summer 2020 rebellions that have erupted in the wake of George Floyd's lynching and continue in cities like Portland? A living newspaper will examine the tensions between abolitionist organizers in the trenches and liberal reformers who are using the moment to raise their personal profiles. Audience, audiences will see racist police union bosses cable news anchors who express sympathy for protesters while stigmatizing looters, and the political prisoners who have been behind bars since Ferguson. Instead of ending with resignation in this future project, I intend to show what happens after Sergeant Vivian Innes, the play's protagonist, leaves the police force. She goes into the community to work with abolitionist organizers, divulging law enforcement secrets and assisting in the formation of a world without police. Lights up on an interrogation room. Mr. Jackson said that you kicked Kenny Williams in the head three times. Mm -hmm. The ME determined that he died from head injury. I don't remember that, but he did get into a bar fight two hours earlier. Jackson lied about the kicking. I can't imagine why in the world he would do that, but he lied. Tried to throw me under the bus, and he got fired for it. Look, I'm not sure if I like where this is going. I just want to make sure we've covered all our bases before I officially close the case. Really? really? Yes, really. There were more than 20 hotel guests and employees who said they didn't see me do nothing. Uh, because she coerced them into saying that. Look, 
I know this is personal for you. Jackson grew up in your neighborhood and everything, but he was often inappropriate. How exactly? Well, I caught him checking me out once. I bent over and picked some paperwork off the floor, and when I got back up, his eyes were fixed on my posterior. Are you sure that he was looking at you? You see what she's trying to do? Trying to turn me into a super predator. A scary old backbone. I mean, I didn't want to turn it into a whole thing, but it seemed to imply he lacked some focus and discretion. That's very circumstantial. Just wanted to paint a complete picture of him, darling. And look, I know you want to make a lieutenant, but this has been resolved. We need to unite together as officers, and you're being divisive. This boy, Mr. Jackson, whatever. He was terminated because he wasn't cut out to be an officer. The brass called a panel and decided to let him go, and that's it. I've been answering questions about this case for the past three months, and everyone, everyone keeps trying to pin this on me. This is sexism and ageism. If I were a male officer, all of this would have been swept under the rug. She keeps deflecting. Wait. Well, wait. You're not trying to wrap this up. You're trying to trick me. Are you some kind of Black Lives Matter plant or something? Why are you so dead set on bringing me down? I'm your sister. You are not my sister. You are <coughs> illegally disinterested. All this puffing and puffing like you're Olivia Pope or something. Well, let me tell you. Even if you think I'm too old for Jackson to check out, even if you think something fishy happened at the hotel that night, that kid was never meant to be an officer and he couldn't handle the job. That wasn't for you to decide. Look, I get it. We need more officers who look like the people we serve. But we wouldn't be in this situation in the first place if we didn't have all these diversity programs. If you want to come out and say I was unqualified to lead this investigation, come out and say it. Wasn't saying that at all. I'm just saying, be glad you were born nearly two decades after I was. You should be thanking me. I cleared a path for you. I'm going to retire walking a beat because no one ever encouraged me to do better. Kenny Williams' death was not the result of a bar fight. You think I killed him? The medical evidence. Was it your dad? Oh, excuse me. Deputy Commissioner Ennis. Put in a good word for you? Couldn't get a job on your own, even with that fancy art history degree from Princeton? So sad. The medical evidence was inconclusive, sugar. You don't really know what happened. I know you killed him. And I know your boy is a liar. You killed him. You killed him because black life has no value to you. Because, because you're a sociopath. Because you're a white woman. Because you'd rather protect property than to serve people. Because, because you could. I can have you written up for your insubordination. I can end your career. Uh, so, you gonna arrest me? Well, I didn't think so. Anyhow, it was great speaking to you, hon. Get out! This week. Killing a public servant will get you executed. Consider it a kind of restorative violence, a response to his cry for help. Listen, this whole thing with Stacy, you weren't trying to show me anything. You were trying to prove to yourself that there is something to be redeemed in this department, and there isn't. Police departments are not just here, but anywhere, are fundamentally anti black institutions. You know I appealed my fire in court. Guess what the judge told me? What? She said she didn't know if Stacy killed Kenny Williams or not. 
<clears throat> and then she said, police departments are given a presumption of correctness. Basically, the police are right, even when they're not. If you're not a coward, if you don't want to be a part of an institution that is covering up a man's murder, you will turn in your badge and shield tonight. Thank you. Thank you to all of our panelists and we welcome all of our panelists back to the screen at this time. Now that everyone has shared with you attendees, we open up the Q&A, which you should see on the bottom of your screens. I just wanna offer this small caveat before we begin the Q&A. We all know that the membership of APA is all very smart people. With that in mind, I ask that we take this time to focus on questions centering on our panelists' work. As people jump in, I'm just going to start with a question that came through earlier in the session, and that was a question about how with these performances being recorded or um, made digital, how it expands the idea of who we can share them with. Um, thoughts that uh, panelists have about sharing performances that are recorded and how we might best compensate the artists involved. I know um, Kaya and Jordan both touched a little bit on this, but I would invite anyone to uh, field that question and talk about sort of this idea of extended sharing and how we compensate artists as their images and work um, go out into the sort of internet yonder. Her, um, I'll just say that I know um, I saw somebody asked a question about different performances being available. Um, I, for processing, we didn't make it available after that because their actors still have to make a living. And I think one of the things that Equity and other organizations are talking about is making sure that um, this doesn't become an avenue for exploitation of work and recognizing it as work. Um, and so. Um, and because Natural Shocks was done as a fundraiser, I think that's still available with the request that people donate. Um, the other performance, the contract period for that reading is over. And so it's it's not available, but we are looking um, for partners to continue to produce. And Celeste is continuing to work on the script to do another reading. I can add that for the playback performances, there's the added sensitivity of the fact that we're working with the audience's stories. And so while we make recordings of all of the events for our internal training purposes, we don't share those without consent. Um, I did see that one of the challenges for me was um, getting feedback and documenting my work. But then what that did is it inspired me to think about how, um, despite not having documentation, I can still help people experience it. And now my next, next step that I'm doing in developing the piece further is to uh, package it so that people can buy it. It'll, it'll happen for a, for a price. And the package, the experience will essentially be um, mailed, shipped to their doorstep. And they can then make it there. So they are still, the site specificity and the immersive part of it is still there. I think on, uh, you know, on an optimistic day, I feel like, the, you know, there's going to be all these wonderful legacies of this time in terms of accessibility for performance, in terms of a democratization of theatre, in terms of, you know, actually, a, you know, potentially a wider uptake. Um, in my more cynical moments, I feel that maybe the one thing that we can expect as a kind of lasting legacy of this time 
is that somebody will figure out how to really effectively monetize live performance. Um, and I think it, it's still, uh, in, in my experience, at least, um, you know, uh, outside of the, the really big uh, organizations, I think it's still, uh, you know, challenging to work out how to how to pay people outside of commissioning. So the, the piece that um, that I screened was something that was that had a commissioning fee, and therefore it was possible to pay all the perform all of the performers from that, and then just share the piece uh, permanently. Um, but of course, that's you know that's a very different model from being able to tour work, which is which is what we're all kind of used to. Um, and uh, and of course, there's not just the immediate uh, impact of COVID on uh, you know on the touring. Uh, on touring, which is that we can't do it at the moment, but also a lot of the touring infrastructure is is crumbling uh, <laughs> around us. Um, I I sort of want to stop talking because I feel like I've <laughs> brought things in a depressing direction. So uh, I'm just going to mute my mic. Well, I wanted to um, I wanted to work this into the presentation, but I did want to take some space to um, acknowledge the performers. Uh, Deja Abdeel was Vivian, Alan Portery was Kevin, and Kenlyn Peters was Stacy. And you know, I think that my sort of situation is complicated because it wasn't an equity production; it was you know under you know, Cornell um, undergraduates and graduates in the cast. And so, but I do think that as um, a piece of work. Is disseminated more widely. I think that you know you do have to start thinking about sort of these questions of uh, compensation and, and ethics. Hey, we have a question in the Q and A um, talking. We actually have two questions from two different people that center the same theme. And one of the questions was uh, sort of building off of Toby's question that he asked in his presentation about what does theater in a digital format offer that a video or film doesn't? And what were the presenters takeaways? Um, and I'm just gonna add on to this and then hopefully we can have sort of a robust conversation. This idea about being, there are times when being on video or in Zoom can be sort of more engaging in some ways with something that Jordan was talking about that the audience might be sort of more present in this configuration. So I'm hoping our panelists can speak to those questions now. I think that the major um, the major benefit of Zoom performances and digital performances is accessibility. You know, you you can watch um, you know these performances from anywhere. Like I've been participating from uh, you know parts of the conference from my my bedroom and various rooms of my home. And I, I you know you don't have to worry about sort of um, the various discomforts that that uh, come with attending. A, a live performance and this sort of the politics behind theater etiquette, which is um, you know often used to sort of keep certain communities out of the theater as well. And so it is. I I've really um, I think that you do you do um, sort of lose that that immersive quality of of theater that you get when it's live. But I, I think that the accessibility is is really wonderful. I might add, I totally second this theme of accessibility that several people have mentioned, but that also, um, as I think people may become tired with pre-recorded broadcasts, that there's a democratization of uh, how we make theater, that now it is more accessible to create something live via Zoom or Twitch or any other platform. Um, and that as that gains, um, a, a, uh, acceptance that maybe more people will have purchase on theater making and theatrical practice who wouldn't have otherwise. And I suppose then the question becomes what 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 is the difference between a a vlogger and uh, you know what is the difference between a, a vlogger and a theater maker who is using uh, the same technologies and the same platforms that uh, you know that uh, a, a live vlogger, you know, uh, and and of course, uh, I'm, uh, uh, a lot has been written about you know uh, live streaming as live pre pre COVID non theatrical live streaming as um, as theatre. So yeah, I mean, I suppose um, is it is the distinction useful between <laughs> theatre and not theatre? Um, in if if it's not taking place inside a theatre, how useful is that distinction? 
Um, I just want to add to it that um, when we are talking about remote performances, the focus seems to be online or Zoom. But I think that there is, there is the option to go beyond that and make it, um, make it also over the telephone or sending messages. And I think there is a lot of um, other uh, options that we can explore as theater makers. Um, because when we are sticking to only a Zoom platform and getting them to just watch a video, um, of course, while there is the option of sending messages and interacting if the artist and the audience are both live participants, but somewhere it, it does slip into a passive mode. So uh, there, are, there are other options that we can explore in creating remote experiences. Um, and one thing is also like sending physical objects if that can be incorporated into performances. That inspires me to add on too that there can be an assumption to think of Zoom as neutral territory, but as we consider questions of accessibility, it's also important to remember that not everyone has access to Wi-Fi or um, laptops or technology. And so I definitely second what Divya is offering there. Excellent. I have another um, question in the Q&A that says, in these online performance spaces, how do you go about curating or inviting audiences? And is that process similar to or different from what you would go through if the performances were in person? Yeah, I think this is where community becomes important. So people who have wide communities, you know, theaters latch onto this term community engaged. Um, and some people are doing it, some people aren't, but people who exist in spaces that really are community engaged, there's this opportunity to reach into audiences that aren't necessarily theater going audiences. And so I think processing was a great example of that. We suddenly had this entire audience of black economists because they were hungry to see their story told because they're an ignored population. Um, and also we partnered with several immigrants' rights uh, organizations and uh, immigration organizations uh, and legal justice organizations that were local and community-based. So not necessarily like going to the ACLU, but in Durham, there were um, some local organizations that did food collection and, um, and those expanded the audience and then making accessible ticket sales. So thinking creatively and using radical imagination and ticket sales. So often you can do a donation platform. Um, you know, I won't list all of them, but there's a ton. And then it becomes a different sort of pay what you can. So when people are moved, they actually, we I've seen, you know, lots of contributions, but then also making it open and accessible for people who may not be able to right now. Um, I've seen, uh, I forget which theater company, but somebody did really creative things with dual programming so that there was something for kids to watch so that parents could attend and it became accessible. And so I think just really thinking about the, the ways in which we can make things accessible and also the ways in which we connect to our communities and breaking down barriers around that. Great. Thank you so much. There was a question um, in the chat and I, I will tell the audience who's watching that I'm trying to toggle between both the chat and the Q&A. So it might just take me a little bit of time as I have these little boxes up on my screen. But um, someone was asking Kristen about sort of dealing with the actor's biases in that particular piece that she wrote. And um, I was hoping she could speak a little to that. Yes, thank you, Megan, and thank you, Julianne, uh, for that wonderful question. So as the playwright, um, most of my conversations uh, happened with the director, um, Alaigu Ame, who's also a recent um, Cornell PhD graduate. And um, I think that probably the most I felt like the actors, you know, they were really wonderful. They were all sort of on board, you know, with the message of the text. Um, and I think that, you know, th there weren't any issues with them politically. And I think also this 10 minute play festival process moves very fast too. I do think that probably the only point of contention that I experienced was actually with the director. We had um, a conversation about um, some of the projections that uh, appear at the very beginning of the play that I, you know, that they weren't they weren't shown in that excerpt, but um, he wanted to show 
um, you know, one of one of the sort of the many, you know, videos, I mean, I'm sure many of you have seen on your on your Twitter and social media timelines of like a black person being killed. And I, I had a very strong objection to that, just because I feel like we are sort of so saturated with trauma and with, you know, these videos of black people being murdered online that, um, you know, they've lost a lot of their um, their impact and context. I think it was one thing, you know, for Emmett Till's mother in the 1950s is to show his open casket. But I feel like we've been bombarded with that imagery, you know, for so long that it that it only serves to re-traumatize Black people who, who are watching. And so um, I, I think that was the sort of the only um, political disagreement. And then the, you know, we didn't show those images. Um, there was a more of a, a more theoretical graphic that opens the show. Um, but yeah, but thank you for that question. They're coming in quickly now. Um, there's a, a question about sort of how we deal with the idea of Zoom fatigue. And, and I'd like to pair with that question, this idea of um, how we deal with the audience being disembodied from us that we are sort of experiencing in real time in this moment. So um, those questions are about dealing with sort of screen fatigue or Zoom fatigue in general, and then also how to um, maybe get over the hump of not being able to see and engage with your audience. I could answer from the, the perspective of our project. And I think many playback companies are doing this, that there will be incorporated in the playback experience on Zoom moments to stretch or to dance. Um, there can be audience participation in the enactment of other people's feelings and stories. There could be breakout rooms, which allow for conversation between audience members. Um, and that these are all ways of diversifying the, the modality of your experience and maybe reducing some of, some of the Zoom fatigue. Though I also don't always feel like going to a playback performance online after a long day of conferencing, for example. <laughs> And maybe to be further explicit and clear, we use not the webinar feature for our performances, but Zoom as a baseline in which everyone's cameras and microphones are accessible to contribute. Yes, I just, um, building off that idea of accessibility, I wanted to invite the panelists and starting with Kaya to speak to this idea of the digital divide right, that we talked about before, that as much as we can engage with audiences on Zoom in a new way or learn how to sort of moderate our use of it, that there is sort of a, a, a huge amount of the community that's being left out for that and um, sort of how we deal with that. Yeah, I think it's interesting because there was often a theater divide, right? Like I was able to finally take my son to a discounted show on Broadway after 10 years because it's so freaking expensive. Like theater... Um, can be incredibly inaccessible. And most, most people have smartphones. And so I think it's then thinking about the platforms and the ways to do low cost streaming. Um, to do, you can, um, La Jolla Playhouse is doing something really innovative right now with a children's show um, where there's a list of materials that you can gather. People are sending things in and out. Um, I know um, there is a designer named Ian at Lake Folsom College, I think, who was talking about some of the stuff he's doing, sending a packet to each student uh, that has lighting and a camera and that the college has a loaner computer program so that people who have their own computers have something, but then everybody's getting a backdrop and lighting and a camera. And you can do that for a couple hundred dollars. And so what if we take production budgets, let's say at a university or to, and send things out. Um, I was on a panel with Nicole and um, an artist named Lady Dane, and they were talking about paying a little bit extra to artists when you ask them to be able to stream because that's being written into actors' contracts right now that we have to have the capacity to stream. And so I think there are definitely creative ways to think about this and to make sure it's accessible. And I think sometimes um, we cut ourselves off before we even start to think about the possibilities. So you can do um, 
closed captioning. You can do new things with a visual medium, but it requires getting in there and, and not dismissing it. Um, and so I think, again, there's some really exciting things that you can do with accessibility. I think there's some great things that you can do with apps and phones. And I think it requires us getting out of our small, you know, we've even had debates about like, should we do this if we're called a theater department and this is acting on screen? And like, right now people are, are searching for ways to reinvent the art form. And I think, you know, that if you see a problem because that's why we come together as a collective, how do we introduce those problems, but then not use them as stopping points to use the problems as the starting point? Um, I, um, I absolutely agree. I think that's something that's important to guard against as well is that I think certainly in my experience, it's very easy for, um, you know, even though there are ways in which accessibility is increased, um, I think particularly from the artist side, actually, a lot of the sort of inequalities that exist within theatre are being replicated um, in uh, replicated online. Uh, I mean, there was a the the kind of first wave of big of highly publicised um, uh, uh, kind of uh, filmed production filmed big budget productions that came out were very much uh, felt like a step backwards actually in terms of the, the of the diversity of voices uh, that were being uh, that were being platformed, and um, and I think. Certainly in the UK, we're still sort of slightly dependent in terms of accessing audiences. We're slightly dependent on the same infrastructures, uh, not the physical infrastructures, um, but we, we, you know, it helps to be under the auspices of a large institution with an existing audience and, you know, an existing ways of, of communicating with that audience online. So I think it's, it's very easy actually to see this, uh, this idea of, of something that's suddenly being opened up. Uh, to formal people, but actually behind the scenes, a lot of the same power, a lot of the same gatekeepers are still uh, uh, are still, um, you know, exercising the, the same controls as before. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, sadly, we're up against it for time, but I hope that attendees are seeing that some of the panelists are sharing contact information in the chat if you want to continue the conversation. Um, I just want to take a moment to thank all of our panelists again for this plenary. Um, and I hope all of you will attend the third all-conference plenary, Humanizing the Digital Pedagogy, on Thursday, July 30th, in the same time slot, so 1.30 to 2.45 Eastern Daylight Savings Time in the United States. And that you'll also engage with, there's a, a fourth plenary that is an asynchronous plenary, and that's in the on-demand videos. And it shows, it has our colleagues in um, AFA membership showing you how to use innovative digital software for your theater classrooms and performances. Um, once again, I just wanna thank all of the plenary speakers again, and thank all of the attendees for coming today and watching AFA Conference 2020.